Okay, well, hi everyone. So uh, my name is Rebecca Helm, and I'm going to be telling you about the ecosystem at the ocean surface today, and then uh, hopefully presenting you with some thoughts for uh, modeling uh, the work that we'll be doing a little bit later on in this session. So first I would just like to send a huge thanks to the organizers. I really, really appreciate what you're doing, and I'm so grateful to be here to be talking about this topic. Uh, and to all of you. So thank you very much. So a little background about me. I don't usually present this information, but since we're all sort of new to this, uh, I am an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina in Asheville, and I'm also a research associate at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was at the Smithsonian before as a postdoc from 2017 to 18, and then before that, I was at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for a couple years. And then I did my PhD at Brown University. So it just kind of gives you a little idea of like where I've been and what I've been up to. And then most of my research has really been focused on jellyfish and their relatives. So I didn't initially come into this as an expert on all neustonic organisms. In fact, I think most neustonic organisms have so little known about them that you could read a couple papers and sort of have a very strong command of the field. But I became interested in part through my research in jellyfish. And I became involved because other people were sort of pointing out potential problems associated with the ocean surface habitat and the ocean cleanup project. And so I began initially by just sort of lending support to that discussion. And eventually, I published an article in the Atlantic, which I believe is part of how this workshop then came to be, uh, talking about the ways in which this very poorly understood ecosystem could be impacted by something like ocean cleanup on the surface. And I can tell you I have a couple hopes for what can happen here today. So, First, I really want to emphasize that although the ocean cleanup is really blazing a trail, it's far from the last organization that's going to be going to the high seas to collect plastic. In fact, there are already other organizations that have acquired a substantial amount of funding to do similar types of projects. So the work that we're doing here, although it's specific to the ocean cleanup, I believe it will have implications beyond that, which is part of why I feel it's so important. So other organizations will and already are following in their footsteps. And so I think now is the time to ask, you know, how should we protect the high seas, especially given all the uncertainty that we have about this environment and the organisms that live there. So I'd like to get started by talking a little bit about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And we've seen a lot of talks today that have referenced it but I thought I'd give folks a little bit of background on what this region is and why we call it that. So the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a term that was really popularized in the 1990s, but refers to a region of the ocean that scientists call the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre. So that's the original name of this feature in the ocean, and it has since also been somewhat synonymous with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. There are multiple gyres across the world's oceans, and in all cases, they concentrate floating objects or floating habitat, right? So they're places where sort of currents converge and swirl around, and so large masses of floating objects can get concentrated in these gyres. And one example that I'm quite fond of, especially being from North Carolina, is the Sargasso Sea. So this is the North Atlantic gyre, and this is a very unique habitat that compared to all the other gyres has been quite well studied. We still know very little about the Sargasso Sea, but we know that it hosts a unique ecosystem of life, and uh, that concentrated floating neustonic algae is important to that life and habitat. And so here you can see a really cool example of a frogfish that's adapted to live in the seaweed that floats at the surface of this gyre. So there's the Sargassum seaweed that floats in the gyre, and all of these animals have adapted to live in like this inverted ecosystem at the ocean surface and sort of crawl around on the seaweed as it sort of hangs over the abyss. 
But we don't really think about the North Pacific subtropical gyre in the same way that we think about the Sargasso Sea. So the Sargasso Sea as a gyre is also concentrating plastic, right? But we also know a lot about the ecosystem, ecosystem of the Sargasso Sea, and that ecosystem discussion tends to be what we talk about. But in the North Pacific subtropical gyre, we don't know as much about the ecosystem. And when you search the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, you get images like this. So you get tons of plastic on beaches, right? And these big plastic slicks and all of that very serious stuff. I mean, this looks horrible, but of course you can tell this isn't from the garbage patch, right? Because there are mountains in the background. So even though this is one of the first images to come up when you search the garbage patch, this isn't from the garbage patch. You get people talking about a trash island the size of Texas. You get people posting about, you know, a trash island the size of Russia. So this is sort of the popular narrative of the garbage patch. And it is really popular. So for example, uh, there's someone contrasting all the money raised for the Notre Dame Cathedral after the fire compared to the garbage patch. And none of these pictures are from the garbage patch, right? So they all highlight a problem, of course, that marine plastic can be very harmful to marine life, but they're not talking about the garbage patch. Still, that fact didn't stop it from being shared over 100,000 times. So what is the garbage patch actually? This is a photograph that my colleague Miriam Goldstein took when she was studying organisms in the garbage patch. This is what it looks like. If you were to go to the surface of a ship and look out, you would see this. And if you were look to look down in the water, you might see a speckling concentration of floating plastics like this. And occasionally you'll see like larger plastic drift nets. But the concentration of plastics in the garbage patch is considerably smaller than the public perception of that concentration, which I feel like is important for this sort of general narrative to be very clear about. In addition, there's really more to the garbage patch than garbage, right? Which is part of why I don't particularly like the term, because it sort of focuses on the plastic rather than on the whole ecosystem, including the plastic. So there's life at the ocean surface that is really connecting the sky and the organisms that live in the air, seabirds and the like, uh, to the ocean below. And now I'd like to give you a little tour of what it is. So this is, for example, a blue button, uh, also known as porpita. The species of a lot of these are sort of uncertain because there have been many species names proposed and then they've been scratched and then new species names have been proposed and then scratched because we just have insufficient data to really distinguish species. So I'm mostly referring to them by their genus name. So this is blue button porpita. And you can see this is the size of a coin. It has a central float that's brown and then this ring of tentacles and it sort of pulses and floats on the ocean surface. These are blue sea dragons. These are slugs that float upside down on the ocean surface and they actually eat porpita. So here you can see them chowing down on some porpita right now. Paper nautilus octopus will use the ocean surface to fill their shell for buoyancy. Of course, flying fish use the ocean surface habitat as a means of escape from predators. Yanthinus snails or violet snails build a raft out of snail mucus and bubbles. So here's this snail getting ready to dip its body into the air. It's going to catch a little bubble of air and it's going to wrap it in snail slime. These animals can't swim. They're about this big as adults. They can't swim. So very treacherous life. Man o' war is quite infamous. So a lot of people know those. Very few people know man o' wars have fish that often live in amongst their tentacles. So these fish could be part of the community as well. And man o' wars, blue buttons, are often eaten by the blue sea dragon Glauca, so there's chowing down on one. But they're also eaten by things like turtles. So here's a young turtle checking out a man o' war, very exciting, so delicious, right? Nice spaghetti dinner. And I mean, this turtle is just like going to town. So these are a great sort of food source for young turtles. And then we also have Valella, 
which Dr. Powell would be talking about a little later. These are the by the wind sailors that have a little sail. They're related to blue buttons, but they do have that nice sail, which kind of gives them that added power to capture the wind. And these are about this big, at the largest, that I've seen anyway. And you'll notice they just kind of hang out, right? Most of these animals are incapable of moving on their own, which is why things like sunfish can sneak up on a valella and just eat it right off the surface of the water, right? So there are a diverse array of organisms that live right at the surface that are preyed upon by organisms below and above the surface. So I'd like to introduce you to some of them in more detail. So we don't know how many species there are. So from a risk perspective and uncertainty perspective, that's a big question mark, right? So we're just gonna go with SPA and we can bracket that with sort of overestimates and underestimates based on how many species there were versus how many species there are today. I think for Valella, we currently have Valella Valella as what's considered the most common species. But I think, you know, they're on the order of tens of names that may or may not actually be species. So Valella is an animal that sort of forms the basis of a lot of this Neustonic food web. So this food web at the ocean surface depends on organisms like Valella. And so here's a little regatta of by the wind sailors kind of hanging out. And you can see the little sail pops up and allows them to catch the wind. And then they have these tentacles down below, which they use to feed. And so if we watch this video, let's see, there we go, of some little by the wind sailors floating around. We know that Valella primarily prey on slow moving organisms. So these animals are not contributing to sort of the fast moving prey, but they are eating a lot of fish eggs for example. So when we think about connectivity of the Neustan ecosystem to the broader ocean, we think about Valella in terms of relations to, to fish and to fish eggs, so it's an important predator in that regard. And so oftentimes fish eggs will be extremely buoyant, they'll pop to the surface, and then Valella will sort of catch them and eat them. The life cycle of Valella is probably the best known of any Neustonic organism. So we know that the sort of most commonly observed stage floats on the surface, right? That's the by the wind sailor. But these animals actually produce jellyfish, which is why I became really interested in them initially. And so they make these really small jellyfish that are only about a millimeter. And we really don't know where they go, but at a certain size, they do produce jellyfish. One study said, the jellyfish sink into the deep ocean. Another study said they stay at the surface. There's good evidence for both. The jellyfish themselves are similar to coral and they actually have algae in their body to harness the energy of the sun to photosynthesize. So there is strong evidence they stay at the surface, but they could also go down to depth. We really don't know. So that's kind of a mystery. What we do know is that the jellyfish are sort of the sexual stage of the life cycle. So they'll release either eggs or sperm and then those will form an embryo that then turns into these little floating valella that pop back up to the surface. And they pop back up very small and they're very poorly known because if you see them on the ocean surface, they look exactly like bubbles, right? I mean, they are, they're little bubbles wrapped in like two cell layers. So they're quite hard to find, although probably more common than we realize. Blue buttons are relatives of Valella, so they have a really similar life cycle and are preyed upon by similar animals, but they don't have that little sail. So some of the research that I've been doing this year suggests that blue buttons are much more restricted in distri distribution than Valella, probably in part because of that difference in windage, right? So depending on how much an organism sticks up from the ocean surface will change how that organism is impacted by the various qualities of the ocean surface, whether it's currents or wind or what have you. But they do also produce little jellies. What we know about them beyond that is it is unknown what happens to the jellies. man wars are probably the most well-known and most infamous, infamous members of the Neustan, and so I won't say too, too much about them, other than that a colleague of mine is sort of studying man wars and 
um, the taxonomy of man o' wars is just like, so in terms of number of species, etc., like we don't really have a good handle on that. There are also snails that float on the ocean surface, and these are really feeding on manowars, on blue buttons, on valella. So these are predatory animals. So there's yanthina, there's also reclusia. And these are particularly susceptible, I, I fear, to sort of large scale collections of surface floating objects. Because the females carry eggs on the raft, the snails actually need to bump into each other to mate which is really unusual for a lot of marine organisms. They just kind of like release their eggs and sperm into the water and sort of hope for the best. These guys actually have to bump into each other in order to fertilize. They're also cannibalistic, which must be just like so stressful. So um, really their whole life is just like very intense. Um, and they also can't swim. So they have been knocked off bubble rafts before and they just sink into the abyss. So. These, I think, are particularly vulnerable to um, some of these collecting efforts. And they also only eat what they bump into. So talk about embracing uncertainty. There are also buoy barnacles. So these are barnacles that actually create their own little float. And one of the things I love about buoy barnacles is like most barnacles just like sit on rocks and kind of filter stuff out. These guys have like spines. They eat like fish and stuff. They're aggressive, right? They go after things. And because they make their own little float, when they flap around, they can actually sort of move their little float a little bit. So they're still subject to the motion of the currents and the wind, but they have, they have a bit of autonomy and they're sort of like really out there kicking butt. And they do eat valilla sometimes. Glaucus are probably one of the most well known of the non-infamous, non-stingy kind of Newston because I, there's like a lot of Etsy fans of Glaucus. I don't know why, if you like want some Glaucus earrings, there are so many options for you. And so the underside is actually blue. So these guys are floating upside down. So the underside is blue to blend into the surface of the ocean. And then the top side is white, sort of blend into the clouds. So the idea is that it's a kind of counter camouflage so that predators from below will have a hard time seeing them and predators from above will have a hard time seeing them. And they actually swallow little air bubbles and sort of crawl around on the ocean surface to stay afloat. And then there's a bunch of stuff that frankly we know like next to nothing about. So this is an example of a Neustonic sea anemone. I haven't been able to find like almost any literature on this. It's just occasionally mentioned. Who knows what it's doing? It's somewhat of a mystery. And then to really make things interesting, so we have our little, yeah, so we've got our little marine animals. So far, everything's been kind of good. It's like we got some jellyfish, we got some snails, right? We got some sea anemones, we've got our little ecosystem sort of forming. But these really uh, kind of throw a wrench into this whole canonical ecosystem that's just flipped upside down. So halobates are one of the only known truly marine insects. And they're pond skaters, just like the kind you'd see around here, but they skate on the surface of the open ocean. And so the ecosystem of the Neustin within the Neustin looks something like this. So like Yanthina and Glaucus, they're really predators of the Neustin. They go after a lot of members of the Neustin. So Valella form a core component of that ecosystem. They are eaten by so many different things. Porpita are also eaten. Um, Physalia are eaten. And then in turn, Valella will eat things like copepods or larval fish, right? Porpita will prefer copepods to larval fish. But of course, the Neustin like, aren't floating out there in isolation, right? It's not like you have this Neustonic ecosystem and it's just kind of like all by itself and nothing is interacting with it. In fact, some very large and important commercial predatory organisms spend part of their life in the Neustin interacting with the Neustin. So billfish are one example. Dolphin fish, or mahi-mahi, are another example of large oceanic, commercially important predatory fish that spend their young years in the Neustin. So here's a larval billfish, very, very tiny, very tiny little bill. Here's a larval dolphin fish, or mahi-mahi. And so these will actually stay in the surface and interact with all of those Neustonic organisms. So these are also part of the Neustin for at least some of their life. So if you sort of expand this out, we know of multiple bird species, oceanic bird species, that eat Neustin. 
We also, of course, saw ocean sunfish eating Newston. We know that turtles eat Newston, and we know commercially important and predatory fish will interact with Newston and are part of the Newston food web. In addition to all of these uh, Newstonic interactions, we're discovering new Newston species every day. And for the North Pacific subtropical gyre, there are two species of blue sea dragons that were discovered in 2014 that have only been found in the North Pacific subtropical gyre, or the garbage patch, right? So now we know that at least some species may have a restricted distribution. Obviously, there's a lot more work to be done, but I do find this really interesting and potentially very important. So as scientists, we have to go study and collect Newston, and most of the way that scientists collect Newston today is with something like this. So you have this like, sort of square net, half of it's below the water and half of it's above the water. You throw it on the back of a ship and you sort of drive around for 30 minutes and kind of collect what got pulled up, right? But this actually isn't the only method. In fact, the preferred method for scientists studying larval fish, larval Newstonic fish in the USSR was something that looked like this. So you have a system of floating buoys with a net wrapped around it that sank into the water for some depth, and then you had that in a U-shape behind a ship. And of course, this might look somewhat familiar because this is very similar to the configuration of the ocean cleanup's current system, where you have buoys on the surface, those yellow things, a net wrapping around, and then falling down below. And of course, it's in this nice U-shape, so you can catch and hold all of your Newston, and it's traveling at a different speed from the Newston, so then they will remain in there. Except the difference is when scientists went out to collect larval fish, they were trying to estimate future fish stocks, right? So they were like, how many larval fish out there? How might this relate to how many fish there are next year? They took a Newston tow for like 30 minutes in like three different places. This is gonna be on a massive scale, potentially over years rather than minutes, right? So the systems are very similar, but the scale is totally different. <clears throat> and of course, the ocean cleanup has already collected a lot of Newston. So all of these red circles are by the wind sailors or Valella, which have been caught by the ocean cleanup. And uh, this picture was sort of part of a press release for the plastic that was caught as well. So we can see that there are tons of animals in there and amongst the plastic. And you know, the reality is the better the system is at catching plastic, the better it will be at catching Newstonic marine life, right? They both are really close to the surface, they both drift passively, right? And they both can be held by this system uh, for indeterminate periods of time with the difference being that Neustonic organisms are not adapted to be around hard surfaces. They're not adapted to be corralled. When I take care of jellyfish, you have to be very careful not to allow them to touch the sides too much because they're only two cell layers thick. It's one layer of cells on the outside, a bunch of jelly, and one layer of cells on the inside. So if they bang around on stuff, they're toast, right? So that's really the difference is plastic will stay in the trap, the Neustin will be put at risk just by being caught in the trap. So what do we need to know to assess the impact? So I'd like to go through some sort of common ideas or assumptions and unpack them a little bit. So the first is that plastic is bad for marine life in the garbage patch. And of course we know, yeah, like plastic is bad for marine life, right? So for large animals, entanglement is really the driving reason for direct harm or death. So here you can see, <clears throat> this is the number of individuals. This is from a study that was done, a meta-analysis looking at all the papers that had been published on animal plastic interactions. And the direct death uh, and entanglement is the vast majority, with ingestion of plastic being that very small sort of gray sliver right at the top. So for the vast majority of animals, entanglement is in plastic is really the most dangerous risk. And part of that is you can find an animal that has plastic in its gut, but you can't know why. So a whale will wash ashore with a ton of plastic in its gut, 
And there are sort of two primary possibilities. One is that it ate a bunch of plastic and the plastic killed it and it died. The other is that it was starving, maybe because it's old, maybe because it's sick, and it started eating plastic, right? And we just can't know because you can't do studies on whales like that, right? It's totally unethical. And so a study was done that showed environmentally relevant concentrations of microplastic a negatively influenced larval fish ecology. This was back in 2016. This was in science because it was a really big deal because you know we just didn't have this information before. And then it was retracted for fraud. Yeah, because one of the authors likely made up a large subset of the data. So this is the current state of where we are with plastic ingestion. We know plastic entanglement is really dangerous but we just don't know as much about plastic ingestion. But for large animals, entanglement is a big issue. This is relevant to the North Pacific subtropical gyre because dolphins and whales were first sighted in the North Pacific subtropical gyre this year. So before that, it actually was unknown whether or not they were present in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. However, we don't know how these large animals interact with plastic in the patch. Most of the entanglements are coming from things like right whales and sea turtles, where they're directly interacting with things like crab traps that are present in their habitat where they're foraging and birthing calves and things like that. So we don't know how <coughs> large animals interact with plastic in the patch. We didn't even know that there were dolphins and whales in the patch, at least in the scientific published literature until this year. So that's a complete unknown. So in terms of thinking about risk, we can't know. If they do interact with large plastics, such as ghost nets, which are one of the biggest risks for entanglement, then they're actually direct means for collecting those. So the Ocean Voyages Institute, for example, has already removed 40 tons of plastic from the garbage patch, including five tons of ghost nets, by just taking a sailboat around and picking up ghost nets. Right? And sailors would take tags, GPS tags, and when they saw ghost nets, they would attach them. And then the Ocean Voyages Institute would sail out and collect the nets. So there are very direct ways to target nets. And finally, I'd just like to point out that many of the viral pictures and videos online are from close to shore. Right? So here's one example of manta rays swimming in this field of plastic. This is actually in Indonesia. I've been here. It does really look like this. And so if the goal is to clean the ocean for large animals, I think we really must focus on where we know those animals are and we know they're interacting with plastic, right? Those are both uh, relatively unknown in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. Finally, I'd like to explore this idea that plastic is bad for marine life in the garbage patch itself. So a recent study at the conference that I went to last month called Jellyfish Bloom Symposium found that for organisms like moon jellyfish, there really was no impact of ingesting plastic. They just egested it, which is like a fancy word for like pooping it out, right? So it just like went in, it went out, no measurable impact, which is probably most similar to a lot of the neustonic organisms in terms of like eating and adjusting plastic because they also have jellyfish. So very similar group, very closely related. It's also a little bit more complicated because some organisms frankly may benefit from plastic, right? So plastic serves as a habitat for organisms that raft like these barnacles attaching to plastic bottles. Uh, halobates, those open ocean water striders, actually lay eggs on floating debris. So they have more substrate now to lay their eggs than they did previously. And you know, the reality is the Great Pacific garbage patch has been so impacted by humans even before plastic, it's kind of hard to know how to make sense of all of this. But I suspect part of it has to do that there was probably a lot more wood making it to the North Pacific subtropical gyre before logging, before wide scale damming of rivers, right? There are species that only live on sandals right? There's a species of barnacle that you find on sandals. Sandals haven't been in the ocean that long. What were they living on before there were sandals, right? We've lost a lot of the habitat that might have been entering this region of the ocean. I mean, like flip-flops. Yeah, flip-flop barnacles. Yeah, what were they living on before flip-flops? <laughs> 
So I really want to drive home that the North Pacific subtropical gyre is a unique and understudied ecosystem. You can't just say, oh, plastics are harming turtles, so we need to go clean it up from the gyre because we don't really have evidence that plastics are harming turtles in the gyre. We know where plastics and turtles are most likely to interact. It's not here, right? And in addition, there are lots of animals that we know very little about, right? And all of these other animals depend at least in part on them. So if you're removing Neuston from the environment, you may also be removing food for some of the animals that you're ultimately trying to help. And collecting animals has been a known issue for a very long time for the ocean cleanup, right? So in the first feasibility study, they said that bycatch is an enormous problem for filter-based ocean cleanup strategies, right? And that devices that filter water will filter out similarly sized animals. So this is a real issue and it's a known issue. Another unknown is the impact that the system will have uh, compared to other things like thousands of ships. So Mr. Slot has said, you know, the impact of our system is at nil, but it's many times smaller than the thousands of ships crossing the ocean. Well, this is completely unknown. So for starters, the shipping lanes are north of the garbage patch and the gyre. So a lot of the ships that are passing through, you know, aren't these really large vessels with like massive amounts of cargo. So that's very different. And then many of the species at the surface are incredibly buoyant and lightweight, and they're adapted to being able to potentially be swamped and then rise up. How much can they tolerate that? Like, we have no idea. I've seen Valella get caught in waves and pop back up, but that's sort of the extent of what I know. And sort of some of the work we're trying to do is actually just go out, take a bunch of Neuston, like take them to a certain depth, see how fast they rise and how well they do. So that's completely unknown. Um, Mr. Slat has also said, uh, for what we know, most of the species that comprise the Neuston are ubiquitous and distributed throughout the tropics and temperate zones of all the world's oceans. As I mentioned, like, we don't really have a good handle on species, so this is very, very hard to conclude. And we also know that different gyres have very different ecosystems. So the Sargasso Sea, for example, has a unique ecosystem that's distinct from what you see in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. And this ecosystem, the Sargasso Sea, really supports life in the North Atlantic. So if we know of one well-researched gyre that has a very strong impact on the surrounding ecosystem, could we not infer that other gyres may potentially have an equally strong impact? We don't know, but the one gyre we do know, this is the case. <clears throat> so gyres can harbor unique ecosystems that are absolutely not ubiquitous. Um, and then Mr. Slat has also stated that this isn't a problem because most plankton and nuisance are adapted to high loss rates. It's true that Valella do wash on shore, but many Neuston aren't regularly stranding because they're differentially impacted by currents and winds, right? And so we really do not know. Regardless, putting artificial coastline in the middle of their habitat is very different from sort of accidentally washing up on shore. And then Mr. Slat has also suggested that because Neuston have high reproduction rates, they're adapted to this loss, but like, listen, we just don't know their reproduction rates, right? We know for Valella, but that's kind of it. And even then it's like very preliminary data. So I wish we knew more about their life cycles, but we don't. And so it's really impossible to make such a claim. So I've now done some preliminary sampling in collaboration with Vortex Swim, an organization which has been trying to raise awareness about the issue of ocean plastics. And what we're finding is that Neuston are extremely abundant in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. So here's an example of a Neuston net toe. So this is a sample of Neuston taken for a particular period of time, and then it's dumped on a little mesh, and then all the plastics in Neuston are sort of counted out of it, right? And so you can see some particles of plastic in here, right? There's some plastic, there's some plastic, plastic. So there's plastic, but every little blue ring is a Valella, right? So every one of these blue rings is a Valella. There are some blue sea dragons. There's one right there, there's another right there. All these little purple dots are really young violet snails. 
So there are lots of these organisms in this region of the ocean. Here's another example where you have plastic, but it's also intermixed with larval fish, it's intermixed with young Portuguese man o war, and all of these black dots are halobates, those open ocean insects. And some of them also contain these like gelatinous organisms, which may be jellyfish or some other organism that sort of stays at the ocean surface. You can see plastic in all of them, and I wish we didn't. I really wish plastic wasn't in the ocean. But what I've really come away with is the fact that the Neuston and the plastic are sort of out there and intermixed together. So the key question for me is what will the potential impact of the ocean cleanup be on the Neuston and in marine life in general? And so coming into this, I feel like our challenge is really to model the impact of the ocean cleanup, and we can really only do this for the organism for which we have the most data, which is the by the wind sailor Valella. We can also estimate based on those preliminary samples how much life could be caught per unit plastic, right? And for the Neuston, I think it's really important to actually count the animals because they have adapted to float. They're incredibly light. So biomass might not be the right approach. Counting individual organisms might actually be better. And then based on this, determine if the preliminary results are reasonable grounds uh, to assume potential significant danger. So we have uh, information on Valella life history, which I can provide to everyone. We also have data on animal abundance, thanks to these trolls, which I can provide. And so for my final thoughts from this beautiful picture from the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, is that you know, even with all the uncertainty surrounding this ecosystem, we must really strive to protect and conserve it and conserve and protect life on the high seas. And I think this going forward, legally, in terms of risk and uncertainty, is really where we need to be looking because it is hard to study marine life thousands of miles offshore. There is no two ways about it. And so incorporating risk and uncertainty into that conversation is, I think, going to be especially critical for determining how we protect this unknown or sort of poorly known life at the ocean surface. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for that. That was really, uh, really interesting. Uh, this is a, this is probably a very naive question, but when um, when you say uh, take uh, cold hearted and make well, why not? They're so small. How can why don't they just stick to the net? Because they float. So I mean, if right, this is the challenge, right? Because if you don't want plastic to escape, then you have to have you know, a mesh of a certain size that keeps them from going through. And so it's kind of this combination of one, they're sort of similar sizes in many cases, so they'll be sort of trapped. Two, they can't actually control where they're going, so they can't like navigate around all the plastic. Some of the first, like let's say scenario, first scenario could be, you know, empty net, animal floats in, no plastic maybe some small, small subset of the very, very tiny ones. I don't actually know the mesh size of the net, so I can't really say, but depending on the size, maybe they could slip through. But once there's any plastic in it at all, that's gonna be a barrier, right? Because they can't navigate around that. So it's not just a question of making Right, I mean, then if you do, you're also losing a bunch of plastic, right? understand now there is a trade-off uh, that I don't know actually it's not only like one company uh, there is a trade-off between like removing all the plastic that we know probably is not good for some species it might be good for like uh, your microorganisms uh, so uh, I, first of all my question is uh, about this trade-off and the uh, second question is okay if there is a problem indeed with uh, Or, uh, what is the word that you're using? Houston, Houston. Or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, how can we actually modify the uh, proposed um, uh, methods uh, plastic in order not 
So that's the, so the first point to your trade off. So there's going to be a trade off between collecting plastic and animals. Um, you know, I'm sort of at the point where we don't really know exactly what this plastic is doing in this environment, right? And we can't really infer that it's having the same impact that it has in other areas because this isn't at all the same as right whales and lobster traps. Right? So we don't actually know what the impact of plastic is in the gyre. And I think that's important because the whole idea is plastic stays in the gyre. Right? So it's not like you clean up the gyre and you clean up the rest of the ocean. Right? It's not like it's sort of leaving and floating out at this really high rate. Like the idea is that it remains in the gyre. So we really need to understand like what the impact is on organisms in the gyre. And so in order to even begin to talk about a trade-off, we would need that information and I just don't think we have it. Right? We know that some fish do eat plastic, but again, we don't really know what happens to them. Do they just poop it out, right? Like that one study, we thought it provided insight into that and then it turned out to be falsified. So to that point of the trade-off, we can't even talk about trade-offs yet, right? To the other point of like, what's a reasonable amount of organisms to kill? I mean, Dr. Powell is gonna be talking about that later. So um, I think she might at least begin to explore that question. Um, so that was, okay, I think I got two of your questions. Okay, what so was, the, the technology can be more yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's really, this is the thing, the better it is at catching plastic, the better it's going to be at catching marine life. And I mean, I'm guessing the ocean cleanup engineers probably weren't aware of the Newston net that's used to catch larval fish that looks very similar. I don't know, maybe they were. I know the initial design was sort of based on uh, barriers to sort of keep jellyfish in one area, so that was sort of present. I don't want to speak too much about it because we have experts here um, that can tell you about the history. But I think, you know, what we're seeing is this kind of convergence, like the better you are at trapping plastic, the better you'll be at trapping marine life. And I think to me, the better alternative is to move closer to shore, to get the plastic before it gets out there. And for the large problematic pieces of plastic, like those ghost nets that we know present a potential high risk for entanglement, going and getting those directly. Yeah. And then, and then yes. Or do you have a... Yeah, I may be able to add a little bit on that. Uh, as I mentioned this morning, uh, I think we both repeated it, Hendrik and myself, myself is the status of our uh, design, of, the, of the, the way the system looks now, is not what it will look like in the next iteration or the iteration after that. So we are incorporating a lot of other factors and information to improve our design. Um, so the fact that it looked uh, with a couple of uh, uh, floaters doesn't <coughs> mean anything for what the rest, uh, what it will look like. This was a very basic uh, off the shelf uh, products modular system basically that we compiled. So um, it, it doesn't mean that much yet. Uh, so and I wanted to comment on two more things uh, uh, that you raised in, in your presentation. One is that we don't know or didn't know until this year that large marine mammals uh, actually uh, are present in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The article you raised is an article from our science mm -hmm. scientists and those were direct results from observations we did through our aerial expedition. Um, I mean, if you go uh, through the garbage patch by um, boat, there's only so much of the ocean you can see. So running into an, a, a large ma marine mammal would be, it, it would be very um, accidental, basically. Uh, and in fact, uh, the same goes for a lot of the ghost nets, if they are not tagged, and most of them are not tagged. So, uh, that, which is why we did the aerial expedition. Uh, so that you could 
cover a larger area and have more visuals covering that region. And that is how we discovered that there were quite a mm -hmm. lot of marine mammals present. So they have been there, but not, yeah, the, the, the means of, of spotting them have been uh, very ad hoc or very limited until then. Yeah, no, and that was really good work and it was really neat to see when it came out. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Slat is actually like an author on that paper, if yeah. I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, so, I mean, I do think that's important, but I still don't think that it demonstrates that those animals are having an interaction with the plastic. Yeah. That's um, unknown. That, that's another thing that I wanted to raise, that indeed uh, there's still a lot we don't know about the interaction of plastic and different organisms. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, there are so many different organisms that interact with plastic at some point and whether it's harmful or not. What we do know is from the samples that we took during our mega expedition, I mentioned that briefly this morning as well, that there's a lot of toxics on it. In fact, more than 80% of the samples that we took and investigated had uh, levels of toxic uh, pollutants which exceeded any sort of threshold. So, uh, I mean, if there's interaction also with potentially Houston that may interact or attach to it or bump on it or whatever, uh, there is a high risk of that interaction being well, but I mean, of course, toxins are species specific, right? So there are tons of toxins for humans that aren't toxic at all to other animals, right? So I mean, to say that there are toxins at human levels, but I'm assuming just, human levels. Not, not just human levels, but, but it, it's still, yeah. it's, it is uh, species specific, but there is a risk if it's... Sure, yeah. yeah. So there is a question back here. Oh yeah, I was, uh, thank you so much. Like, it came, came out in, in, in the discussion. Because I was just curious as to whether you think the way forward is is for us to study more uh, about um, is, is as like for your proposition is for us to study more and get more data, get more understanding uh, before we uh, you know we start all this uh, clean up in the jar. Is that your proposition that we need more data and understanding before we just jump to the conclusion that plastic bad is good and let's do this. Yeah, I, I think that there's really, at this point, uh, it will be difficult to evaluate the negative impact of plastic, uh, but you know, based on the fact that these animals float similarly to plastic, we can begin to evaluate the impact of cleanup on them. And uh, you know, I'll let Dr. Powell talk about this a little bit more. It's like not really my area, but you know, I think the reality is until we actually understand what impact plastic is having, we should proceed very cautiously and we should withhold actions until we know that they will, they will actually be beneficial, right? So until we really are confident that collecting all of these new stonic organisms will not have a negative impact and collecting this plastic will have a positive impact, I think it's premature to collect plastic from the North Pacific subtropical gyre, especially when it's incredibly complicated. You know, it's very high risk. And I think, you know, we know the plastic is coming into the oceans from rivers where it's much easier to intercept it uh, before it makes it to the gyre, where we also know that it's going into coastal systems and having those negative impacts that have been published already. Um, that's sort of my thought at this point, yes, is that I do think we need to stop. I think we need to do a lot more research, and I think we need to consider the trade-offs much more thoroughly and seriously before moving forward. So I, I assume that the uh, anadromous fish lobby will be upset about it. Sorry, Sorry the what? Uh, the anadromous, I mean the, the Migrating the, fish? Uh, fish that go in from salt water to fresh water back and forth. They, presumably they're going to be intercepted by the intersect. No, no, the fish can easily escape. Anything that around. can swim. Can that I don't know, yeah. I'm not really like a river expert, so I can't really speak to so that for sure. I mean, you would say the interceptor is a much more exciting, more reasonable thing to do, given the state of knowledge currently. Yeah, That's I true. think collecting plastic closer to the source, as close as we can get, all the way to the point where ultimately we would just produce less, sure. you know, single-use plastic, which I think, is, yeah, everyone's on the, the same page on. Also anticipate the future of Look, the in environmental pollution problems generally are quite complicated. Yeah. So the fact and that we are... And if these plastics are long-lived, have a yeah. long-term adverse effect. The fact that we're drowning in our plastic uh, pollution ourselves, that's a, that's a complicated uh, problem. And, and 
a lot of different things need to happen to actually solve it sustainably, to, to for the long term actually solve this pollution problem. Uh, however, science does show uh, that you both need to work on prevention. And if you want clean oceans, you also need to clean up what's already out there. Um, so we are basing that on that premises. We are doing both. It's not one is more important than the other. Uh, a lot of other things are important in that realm as well. Developing a material use, uh, uh, so proper alternatives or better recycle uh, technology uh, uh, so that we can actually use uh, plastic uh, products more, more than once, that we can uh, invest in, in, in um, treating it as a resource. We need to <coughs> make sure that also uh, countries uh, in emerging economies have better waste infrastructure, uh, that people are educated, etc. A lot needs to happen to, to, for the long term, actually solve this complicated problem. So going back to your point on collecting plastic in the ocean versus the source. Collecting it's versus, it, it's end, both. Sure. Yeah. In the North Pacific subtropical gyre, why? It's not, it's, it's old, it's not the plastic bags, it's not, you know, the straws that are getting up turtle noses, it's very specific kinds of plastic, you know, and it's not leaving the gyre. I mean, you said that, and you, you know, really don't know the impact that it has on marine life. Well, right, yeah, we, and we so have seen, we've collected uh, ghost nets which had entangled uh, animals dead, obviously. But uh, they're we've much seen dead animals, neustonic animals, even drifting on large uh, plastic objects. I mean, th yeah, th there there is a negative impact of plastic also in the North Pacific. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, comparatively, this isn't places where you know entanglement has been documented, where ingestion ingestion has been documented as happening and is having a yeah, detrimental it's impact. It's sport. huge, and it's not really leaving. So why collect it there? Why not focus on beaches? Why not focus on places where you know plastic is interacting with large organisms in well, a negative way? It's a net that's been cut off of a ship, and it's just floating. Just floating yeah. Mm -hmm. Abandoned and lost fishing gear. Well? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so actually, that's the majority of the plastic that's in the it's in that region. In terms of mass. In terms of mass. Sorry, I keep. And they're floating. And they're floating there. Yes. Yeah. I mean, not all of them, but yeah. Sorry, I kept. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I have a couple of things to add. Uh, taking a step back from the more high level strategic back to the question uh, back to that technology I would be I feel we're in a position where we cannot yet say the strong correlation between uh, Houston and plastic capture <coughs> efficiency it, pro it, it might well be because yes they're both surface floaters they are uh, exposed to the same environment conditions but and we will probably learn, learn about that a bit more uh, in the next talk when it then comes to the exact efficiency of collecting that sure. in the system, that's like an ongoing research effort. And that's the second thing I would like to stress again, that we've reached in terms of modeling um, and, and theory and literature review and collaboration with uh, leading scientists around the world, a stage where we cannot, we cannot improve our knowledge anymore without being out there. So being out there for, for this year and those two uh, platforms, that for us were m very much also experimental <coughs> platforms to collect data that is really yeah. vital to, you know, one day being able to do a, an environmental impact assessment of a fleet of systems of a 20 year operation. So I would just like to stress again that we're not at, um, at, at scale up yet. Huh? We're not uh, saying, okay, we're doing a full scale up 20 system 60 system 20 years operation and we have very strict KPIs for ourselves that we assess with that before before we go ahead to the next uh, to the next step so we, we yeah. not, uh, it's not a large as we talk it's not a large scale operation mm -hmm. actually in fact as we talk right now there's no system out there because the uh, one B campaign has just been co concluded one month ago uh, this next step will only be it's a step by step of course yeah. Was there a question in the back? Yeah. Um, 
see right now. Well, it's not because we can't see it. It's just not. Yes, we see the interstellar and there's never. We don't know. 16, 17. There's like a huge sense of light towards the towards the black for plastic. Systems are turned on light. You want to understand it? Mm-hmm. Probably more than. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say so. I mean, I do think that they have some sort of regional concentration so that, I mean, so the thing is, like, the gyre isn't, or the garbage patch, it's not like a place on a map, it's actually constantly moving, it's more like a feature, right? So it's it's actually not trivial to sort of, like, find the center of the patch, right, for example, because that is sort of a somewhat arbitrary and constantly shifting place. I would say that we're incredibly biased towards places that you can reach in a day. Right, so the operating costs of large research vessels on the open ocean, I mean, it gets into the tens of thousands of US dollars every day. So it can be immense to do these studies. But you know, there have been surveys and they're not specific in at least the surveys I know to the gyres, they're sort of surveys that cross the whole Pacific or Atlantic basin, for example. And then you notice these sort of concentrations within these particular regions like the Sargasso Sea. So that's sort of how that feature was sort of determined. Yes? Are there any animals that can metabolize plastic? Um, yes, so there are, uh, in terms of animals, that's a little bit, I'm not really sure because the research that I know on that is like terrestrial, um, but there are microbes that certainly can use plastic as a resource, yeah, in the marine ecosystem. Are we seeing spikes in there? You know, I know that for things like oil spills, it really depends on where the oil spill is in terms of like whether or not you'll see a spike in microbes that in use that as then a food source. Yeah, and so I think in areas where oil is like naturally bubbling to the surface, for example, you see more of that response because those microbes are already there at low concentrations. Um, so wouldn't really necessarily be in this area, but you know, honestly, I don't know. Because I don't know, is the Newston similar to the Sargasso Sea sort of concentrated in the same area? I know it's more by the pencil, but, or is it everywhere in the top layer of the ocean? I don't know, or is it, or so, is it limited to a certain area? Yeah, so some of the preliminary work that I've done that I didn't present 